Well, again, my name is Nick Marnesian, and it's my honor and privilege to be with you here on this exciting day. And uh, what I'd love to do is just jump in, but I want to start with a word of prayer. Could you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you again for this wonderful morning that you've given to us. Again, we recognize that every time we arise in the morning, uh, it's a gift to have that breath in our lungs. And I pray, Father, that now as we come to submit ourselves to your word, that would, people be, would be people who are transformed by it and who are made more into the likeness of your son Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. On July 21st, 2023, NASA lost contact with the satellite Voyager 2. And that was a big deal because at the time, it had been in space for 45 years. It was over 12 billion miles away from the Earth. And it was traveling at 35,000 miles per hour, learning about deep space, sending data and pictures. And so what happened was somebody within the NASA crew accidentally sent a wrong series of commands to the satellite that caused its antenna to point two degrees away from the Earth, thus losing direct contact with the spacecraft. So you can just imagine the panic that's ensuing. They're wondering, oh my gosh, have we just lost Voyager 2? But they had some options. And they tried a number of different things, but they didn't reestablish contact with it until they sent out what they called a long-distance interstellar shout. It's not real space sci-fi stuff here. They sent out this shout on August 4th, 2023, and that's when they were able to grab its attention and start the sending of data and receiving commands again. I'm sure the person who sent that wrong command was very happy that they reestablished a connection with him. I mean, they might have been fired anyway. Who knows? <laughs> cool thing is, though, Voyager 2, it continues on its mission to this day, helping us explore the uncharted space that our glorious God created. Luckily, that wrong command wasn't the final word that the satellite received. Luckily, its mission continued when, it's, when it reestablished contact and got the right command. Today, I want to remind us of what Jesus said to his disciples as his final words. And his final words are ones that you want to hear and hear well because they were a command to his disciples. And they're still a command to us. And I think the church, especially today, needs to be reminded of these words because like the Voyager 2, we are far removed from our commander. Nearly 2,000 years removed in a much different culture as well. But despite our distance, we still need to cling to Jesus' commands. Last words are powerful. And I told you, uh, or sorry, the, yes, last words are powerful. And the last time I preached with you, I told you about the right direction the church needs to go. In the direction of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, today I kind of want to piggyback off of that. And I want us to hear Jesus' words for us even now that dictate our own mission. And we need to get that mission right or we'll lose contact with what our Lord has commanded us to do. You know, there's been a lot of recent proposals as for what the church should do based on different challenges of the day. It's, it's usually titled like, this is the mission of the church. So is the mission of the church all about social justice? Is the mission of the church to fix the morality of our nation? Is the mission of the church to fix economic equality here in the states and worldwide? Is the mission of the church all about having kids and healthy families and marriages? While all admirable causes, they're not the mission of the church. The mission of the church is simple, and it's so simple, in fact, that sometimes we can often overlook it and let it fall by the wayside. The mission of the church is to make disciples. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you the answer up front today in my sermon because I don't want us to miss it. We are to make disciples. And so how we're going to unpack that is we're going to look 
at Scripture, Matthew 28. And we're going to look at what it means to be a disciple and explain that term. And then see how Jesus instructs us about how these disciples are to be made and what they're to do, what they're to look like. So I would ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 8, or 28, starting in verse 16. Again, at the end of the book of Matthew, right before Mark, in your New Testament. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I invite you to read along with me as again, we read God's word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. To the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end. Of the age. So again, my first point is the whole main point of the sermon. That's the mission of the church is to make disciples. And what I want to do is just explain a few things from our text here to make this, this first point. So when we look again at our passages context, we see it's again the very last passage and paragraph in the Gospel of Matthew. It's closing out the story of about Jesus that Matthew has been telling us. Recounting what Jesus did after he was resurrected. It's a mountaintop setting. Something, if you go back and look at the Gospel of Matthew, happens frequently. And when that happens, there's big revelations. So now here we are, ending the book in a similar way, in Galilee, again, the northern territory of Israel, on a predetermined mountaintop, with the 11 disciples, Judas being the missing disciple. They go to this mountain, and they encounter the risen Lord. And they're worshiping. But do you notice what it also said? Also even doubting. I think the reality of all this has left some of them unsure. Maybe less than fully confident, confused perhaps, as to what's going on. And yet even in that reality of worship and doubting, our passage tells us that Jesus still came to them with a big mission. I don't know, maybe there's something there for some of us today, for those of us who might have our doubts. I could go and un 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 unpack a lot more there, but I want to I come again to the main point here. It says, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. In just a few verses, there's a lot of action there. But what we need to know is that the make disciples command is the main verb this is whole verse is revolving around. So the disciples of the Lord are now told to go and make disciples themselves. The disciples are now to be the disciplers. Remember, the disciples followed Jesus around for about three years learning from him. He was their rabbi. That is simply to say that that word disciple means that you are a learner. Disciple is a disciple is a learner. You never graduate from learning about God. And in fact, that word disciple, and sometimes it can kind of become labeled as a Christianese. It's a word that we can toss around a lot. But we don't need to be confused by it. It's simply a learner. To be a disciple is to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn about him and from him. To be a disciple is to be a lifelong learner. Someone who never graduates from the school of Christ. I want to give you an example of someone who I think is one of the best disciples and disciplers that I know of. He's a man in my current church. We'll call him Bob. And he's a man who's um, tall and slender, probably six foot three, twice my age and then some. We like to go on long walks together to talk about a whole host of things. And for every one step I take, he takes you know two or three. So it's quite a workout walking with him. <clears throat> but Bob is, again, one of the best disciples and disciples I know because I've seen him in various instances throughout my years and getting to know him weep over different things that the Lord has revealed to him, sins in his own life or, or, or realities that he's like, oh my gosh, God really has shown this to me recently. I've also seen him come with, to me with joy in his eyes. I mean, just the excitement, you can see it 
when he tells me about something that he's been learning in a book he's reading or in his prayer and Bible study in life. I've seen him disciple men in our church in incredible ways. He's, he's done this um, book study, the, the Beautiful and beautiful Good Life, uh, I believe it is called. And there's three books, and he's led a whole host of men through these books. And I've seen some incredible fruit from that. In fact, he kind of comes to them sometimes, and they have this mantra that they say together. And he always starts off by saying, who are you? And then they have this you know, kind of sentence that they repeat, I'm a child of God, da 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 And he'll just spring it on. I've seen it happen in, in real life where he comes up to them in church right before and says, who are you? And then they're like, uh, and they repeat after him, uh, repeat what they're supposed to. <clears throat> I also am amazed by him because he monthly meets with a group of men who aren't Christians in this uh, group called the Meaning of Life group. And they read different books together, uh, oftentimes not the Bible, but different books that his friends are interested in. And he goes and just listens and also reads the book as well, as, and he, as well, and he engages. And he tries to understand these men's different point of view, and he's always evangelizing, pointing them back to, well, here's what the Bible says. And again, I've seen some fruit over that. He's told me about some of the conversations that he's had with people that are just incredible and life-giving. I hope that you're getting two things from this story about my friend Bob. To be a disciple is to be a lifelong learner. Again, I said he's twice my age and then some. And to make disciples is a lifelong task. For each individual and also for the church. So let me ask you all. It's a question I'm asking myself too. What's your posture currently towards our Lord? Towards your walk with him. If being a disciple means being a learner, what are you learning? How's your learning? What is Jesus teaching you? What are you learning in your prayer life and Bible reading? Are you involved in a Bible study, a small group, or a Sunday school here at Somerset? If you are great, keep at it. And if you're not, join one and be a learner. Be a learner that Jesus would have you be. And also, for those of us who maybe are stagnant or who doubt, as even of some of these disciples did, remember that Jesus still came to them and gave them the mission even in that state. So know this, if you're in that season of difficulty, stagnation, or doubt, even if you have the tiniest flame, Jesus can use that to set ablaze a deep hunger within you. Cling to that hope. Keep searching. Keep pursuing. Even if it's barely there. And our Lord, I know this, He will be faithful even in times of difficulty, stagnation. He is faithful even when we are faithless. Okay. One more thing to say here. We are to make disciples of all nations. Notice that it says, of all nations. And that means... People groups. And what I'm going to explain here is that we're not talking about the 90, 195 countries that exist, but to be closest to the Greek, we are talking about what's called ethno linguistic groups. And what that means is groups of people who are separated by ethnicity and language. Um, again, if you were to look at the Greek, that's what we could best translate it as. So the, the, the Joshua Project has kind of set the task of saying, like, well, how many people groups are there in the world? And this is constantly fluctuating and changing, but there are a Great Commission initiative who estimates that there are about 17,000 different ethno-linguistic groups in existence today. Of those 17,000, there are still 7,000 that remain unreached, which means they have less than 2% evangelical witness in their country or in their ethno-linguistic group. So what that means is there's a lot of work yet to be done. Lots of questions remain here, but the mission that we've been given is global. It's, it's global, it's not just to remain in our neighborhood, it's not even just to go across the country, it's to go global. Jesus' authority is global and cosmic, and so he too wants disciples from every nook and cranny of the earth. The task is large, it really is. A great commission. So what I want to do to zoom out and close this first section is say this. 
We are after making disciples. We want people who follow Jesus. We want people who obey him and listen to him. One way that I could put it is we're after disciples, not converts. Jesus is after people who follow him, not just say that they believe in him. He wants people to learn from him, to cast themselves upon him, who listen to him, obey him, and pledge their allegiance to him alone. Mere converts will not do, but disciples will. As a church, if I'm voted in today, I look forward to making disciples together. And that's what I'm going to be about. Making disciples. No flashy programs, no growth strategies, gimmicks, or tricks, just disciple making. So what that means for me is that I'm going to do my best to help equip all of us here, all of us saints, for the work of the ministry. That's Ephesians 4. Lord the rain, I guess, too. It's a good thing. You know what? It's just falling us from Seattle, honestly. That's all I can have. Last time I was here, it rained as well. So. <laughs> really coming down. I'll keep preaching. Here we go. No way to stop <laughs> So I'll do my best to be a disciple myself and to be a pastor for you all who preaches and prays, loves and stays. All for Lord Jesus and for you. Okay. Let's move on. The mission of the church is to make disciples. But the rest of our passage is going to tell us how disciples are made. The question would be like, how are disciples made though? So what is the means or the manner in which disciples are made? Again, the act of making disciples, it can be characterized, as the rest of our passage tells us, by baptizing and teaching. So while they aren't the only sole means of making disciples, Jesus' mention of them here are giving them the kind of primacy of place for us here in the church. So let's look at baptism first. Again, the church's mission is to make disciples who are baptized in the triune name. So we're to make disciples, and those people are to be baptized in the triune name. So Jesus said to them, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, first off, I think that's kind of a curious way to end the gospel. As one scholar pointed out, this is the first mention of baptism since chapter 3 all the way back at the beginning of the book of Matthew. Now it's part of the Great Commission with some of the last words that Jesus says. <clears throat> what I think this is showing us is that in the ancient culture and the ancient, uh, the ancient readers, the early Christians knew and assumed that baptism was just part of what you did at being a disciple of Jesus. As scholar Don Carson says, the New Testament can scarcely conceive of a disciple who is not a baptized or is not instructed, end quote. So they're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you catch what it says, though? Into the name of not names. I think it would be more easily to read names if we're talking about a distinction, but we're, all, we're talking about unity and also difference within the persons. So we have the singular name in association with the plurality of persons. So this is one text that helps us give credence to our belief in the Trinity being God being one essence and three persons. But this is a little bit confusing, especially if you look in the book of Acts, people can be tripped up by this because we see in the book of Acts, sometimes people are just baptized into the name of Jesus alone. So what are we going to make of that? Well, two things. Firstly, I don't think we are tied to a strict baptismal formula necessarily. And even though I decide with how baptisms have been traditionally administered, um, I don't think that a baptism will be invalid if the formula, so to speak, is messed up, so long as it's not way off base. I mean, for instance, let me give you an example. In 2022, there was a Catholic priest in Arizona who was found to have made thousands of invalid baptisms over his career as, as, a, as a priest. He was off by one word. He said, 
we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Son and the Holy Spirit. He said, I baptize you now in the, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't think we need to live in the fear of potentially um, missing one word and not getting it right. But we want to be as faithful to Scripture as possible. So I think we want to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But also we shouldn't be tripped up when we see in the name of Jesus as well. But to kind of build off of that, secondly, I think using the triune name, or just the name of Jesus, are nearly the same thing because if we say in the name of Jesus, we know that Jesus does not say in isolation. Right? We, we know that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So anytime you begin to unpack this on well, who is Jesus, you begin to start talking about the Father and eventually get to the Holy Spirit. So whether we're using the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or just the name of Jesus, we are still declaring that we are baptized into the allegiance of our unique God. We declare in our baptisms that we now belong to Him. And we get to participate in some incredible way the story of God. So not only that though, we are baptized into the life of God. Let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean by that is that when we declare that we're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are saying that when one person of the Godhead moves, they all move together in unison. It's, and it's on our behalf. It's what's called the doctrine of inseparable inner, in, inseparable operations within the broader doctrine of the Trinity. We're not going to get into that whole lot, but what I want to say is that there's a unity as in, in the work of the persons. When someone believes in Jesus, for instance, they have their sins forgiven, and again, when they believe and repent of their ways, they are their sins are forgiven and become children of God the Father because the Father has chosen to reconcile himself to them because of the Son's sacrifice. And then the washing and the renewal and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit has taken place. So when God moves, He does so in the unity of the three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can say a lot more of that, but I want to move on and, and sum up here the second point. We are baptized, and when we do that, it tells the story of God and what He's done for us. And that's why I think it's mentioned here, and that's why we do it as a church still to this day. I mean, it's in the name, Somerset Baptist Church. It's not about some ritual. It's about declaring that God has acted on our behalf. It's about saying that God has acted in history for us. He did not out of obligation, but out of sheer love and grace for us. So what I want to do is encourage you, if you have been baptized, look back on that day. As a great memorial of what God was doing in your life up until then. And know that He is still, even now, working on your behalf. Even now, all the more, He is for you, not against you. I look back on the day that I was baptized with great fondness. I remember still, like, um, at, it was a Youngstown Baptist Church in Youngstown, Ohio, and we had so many people getting baptized that day. We had, uh, like, kind of little kiddie pools filled up all across the parking lot. And there was like a section where the teens were getting baptized, and adults and little kids, and, um, and it was really cool because one of my best friends, he also got baptized that day. And so it, it, I, I look back on that and say, leading up to it, and, and, and especially in my kind of conversion at uh, church camp uh, prior to this, I think, man, God, you were just preparing all these things for me. And I still remember my youth pastor baptized me, and... <clears throat> I'll just never forget that moment because I, I got up, coming up out of the water, and I just felt like, God, thank you for all that you've done. I, I, I didn't realize how far I was from you. Even though I grew up in the church, even though I was a youth group kid through and through, in that moment I just realized, God, thank you for all that you have done. And now I remember back and I say, God, thank you that you are still working on my behalf. If you haven't been baptized, I encourage you to take that step of faith and obedience soon. Be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and declare to the watching world that God is for you, not against you. Again, if I am voted in today as a pastor, I look forward to those baptisms. 
as I've been a part of my current church, I've had the privilege to baptize nearly 10 teens in the last calendar year. And all of those moments have made me cry because each time I know their stories and I know what God has done in their lives. And I look forward to doing that with you too. So as the church, part of our task is to baptize people in the triune name. We're going to head to our last point and it's this, that we are to teach them. Again, if you're taking notes, the church's mission is to make disciples who baptize and train me and who are taught, but specifically they're taught to obey. We're not just taught not to teach anything. No, we are to teach them to observe all that Jesus commanded. So what does that mean though? Well, the teaching that the church does ultimately should lead to obedience. We are not just after simple head knowledge. We're after obedience and life change. Again, it's also, though, Jesus' command. So we're to teach them to observe all that Jesus commanded them. And you might be asking the question, well, what are Jesus' commandments? Well, some have searched the New Testament, and they actually have com uh, compiled a list of 300-plus commands that Jesus gave. We'd be here all day if I went through that list of 300, so I'm not going to do that. Luckily... Uh, an author named Ben Merkel in this book, 40 Questions About the Great Commission, he did us a favor and summed them up into seven commands. So um, I'm going to simply just list the seven commands, and if you're interested in learning more about that, he has different texts and how that apply also in the early church and everything. Um, I can give you a, a printout that I have actually in a yellow folder up here after the service if you're interested in knowing more. But I have a slide actually for our convenience with the seven. So just read along as I, as I, lift, uh, as I list them. Here are the, the some commands of Jesus. Repent, believe the gospel, and receive the Holy Spirit. Be baptized. Love God above all, and love others above yourself. Celebrate the Lord's Supper and worship God. Pray at all times for all things. Give generously of time, talent, and treasure, and make disciples by teaching others to obey Jesus. Notice that these commands are Jesus' commands. They're not the commands of the Old Testament. They've all been fulfilled in Him. And in fact, one simple example of that is that the loving God and loving others command is a great summation of the Ten Commandments themselves. So I think it's again just a staggering claim that Jesus leaves us here at the end of the Gospel and that you're listening to my commands my commandments over against the commandments of Yahweh in the Old Testament. So Jesus has fulfilled all of them and, and, and met them, and so we're going to listen to Jesus' commandments. It's again a testament of the new thing that Jesus was doing in his life, work, and ministry, and even now as he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us on our behalf. So what I think this verse is encouraging us to do is to make sure that we're not just telling people about Jesus, or what to believe about him. But there's also an element of showing me how to obey. Don't just tell me. Show me. Maybe some of you, many of you probably, are like me. And the greatest lessons that you learned about the faith were when people lived it, not just said it. Right? I mean, I was taught about servanthood in church, but I didn't get it until I saw my youth pastor do it. When I saw my youth pastor be the first one after a service when the chairs didn't be picking up, go over there, hop up, and then recruit a bunch of us guys to do it with him. Or he was always willing to go and run errands or do some cleaning. He even then invited us along. Or I remember the times when, again, he was not only um, teaching us about servants, he taught us about you know, being an open and inviting church to, to newcomers especially. And he would see a new kid, and before he went and greeted them, he'd come and pull me aside and say, hey, Nick, there's this new kid over there, and he described him. Why don't you go introduce yourself? And so all those little things added up to where he was not just telling me what to do. He was showing me what to do. So my prayer for us is that we don't just know the commands, but that we obey them. That we observe and keep them as our Lord would have us do. That's what I think it means to be a disciple of Jesus, not just a convert. Again, if I'm voted in today as your pastor, my deep prayer is that you will learn from my teaching and my life. 
and the Lord help me and bring judgment upon me if either of those, if either of those things falls. Again, to sum up, the mission of the church is to make disciples who are baptized in the Trinity name and who are taught to obey Jesus' commands. I want to uh, conclude by reminding you of the important bookends of our passage, the top verse and the bottom verse. Remember, at the beginning, Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. So the church's mission is not just a mission, it's a co-mission. We have been given authorization by Jesus himself to carry out this global task of making disciples. He's given us, through, through his own authority, he's given us the authority to do that. He has all authority everywhere, even in heaven. So he's in control as we go along making disciples. We are not doing this task alone or by ourselves. We have Jesus' own authority on our sides. And not only that, he is with us in the task. He says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's always with us. And let me spell something out for you, because I think uh, sometimes we can lose the power of that word always. And that, that adverb always is the translation of a Greek expression that is literally taken as the whole of every day. So every day, every second, every minute, every hour, start to finish, morning and evening, in the darkest of nights and in the brightest of days, Jesus is with us as a church to help us accomplish the task of making disciples. He is with us always until the very end. We will stay on track if we keep his commands and make, to make disciples. And our mission won't fail because he is with us the whole of every day. The church will make disciples. And I think Somerset Baptist, I've met a lot of you who are disciples. And I look forward to, again, if I'm voted in today, being a disciple along with you. Let me pray.